So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Radio Sofia, an independent platform run by a group of PhD students at IIM Calcutta to discuss socio-economic and political issues. Today, we are going to discuss about one of the most important topics the entire world is grappling with. China emerged as a major power and acquired greater significance as a strategic space in the Indo-Pacific region, competing for greater control over the Indian and Pacific Ocean regions, which has greater implications for global security and commerce. On the other hand, as we know, since the 2008 depression, a lot has changed in the world. And in the three countries, China, US, and India, there are major changes. Chinese presidency shifted from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping, US presidency shifted from Democrat Barack Obama to Republican Donald Trump, and now back to Democrat Joe Biden. The leadership of the Indian government has also shifted from prime ministership of Manmohan Singh to Narendra Modi. So these last dozen years marked major shifts in the geopolitical relations among three major powers competing for economic and political supremacy. And I invite our speaker of the day, Professor Bijupal Abraham, to share his views on changing geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific region and its impact on India, China, and US relations. Professor Abraham currently teaches in the Public Policy and Management Group at Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He has recently uh, published uh, a book co-edited uh, with Professor Partare called uh, BRICS, The Quest for Inclusive Growth, volume one of a three volume series titled The World Scientific Reference on the Economies of BRICS Countries. And he has also penned a chapter in that book, BRICS, The Political Economy of Growth. Uh, Professor Abraham has also widely published in reputed journals on wide-ranging topics in the area of geopolitics. And uh, in 2018, he's also placed on the honor roll of the Binational Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute in recognition of his outstanding contributions and achievement towards fulfilling the vision and mission of the Institute. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor Abraham, for accepting our invitation and being here. The stage is all yours now. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, first of all, Kranti, for that uh, very warm uh, introduction. And thank you for this invitation to uh, share my thoughts on the topic uh, with you today. Uh, it is um, a topic which uh, I'm keenly interested in, uh, given my uh, primarily, primary interest in uh, international affairs and also uh, in terms of the Indo-Pacific region in particular. Um, so what I will do during the session uh, is essentially, uh, you know, talk about uh, talk about uh, four things. Um, so um, I'll start off by providing a bit of historical context uh, to this to this uh, to this uh, relationship, um, and I'll talk a bit about uh, how the three uh, countries really have found the going difficult as far as bilateral relations among the three are concerned. Um, I'll then talk a bit about uh, the domestic challenges uh, that are facing uh, the governments in all the three countries today and how that impacts their view of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I'll then look at uh, how bilateral ties are likely to evolve in this triangular relationship and then also the possible impact on the region. Um, and at the end, uh, you know, I would take uh, uh, some questions uh, on uh, uh, what I have uh, talked about and also larger issues if there are questions, if any. So what I would like to do is speak for about 40 minutes or so, not, not 40, 45 minutes or so, and then, uh, you know, leave more uh, some time for uh, question, answers as, uh, question answers as well. Uh, and before I start, one of the things that I would like to mention is that, uh, uh, you know, part of what I, I'm going to present today is uh, part of work that I am currently doing with Professor Parthore on this particular topic. So, you know, some of the uh, ideas and some of the uh, uh, things that I'm going to talk about is the result of joint work. Uh, um, either it has been published or it's, uh, you know, uh, it is stuff that we are working on. Uh, so I just wanted to thank Partho also for his, for his contributions. Uh, just wanted to say that it's not, you know, it's not entirely my own. Okay. So uh, let's go first to the, uh, to the whole issue of uh, uh, the historical context uh, of this relationship. Now, one of the things that you notice when you look at these three countries and the history of the relationship over the past seven decades or so, uh, since the early 1950s, is that uh, all the three countries have never had good relations among themselves at any single point of time. Uh, in the sense that all three have not shared a good relationship between each other at any one point of time. Um, and frequently, uh, what has happened is that two countries have actually 
uh, you know, sort of work together in competition or against the other. Um, so that's one interesting aspect of this of this triangle. It, it's a kind of an irreconcilable triangle in that sense. So if you look at history, uh, we see plenty of examples of that happening. So if you look at the period from around 1950 to 1962, that was a time when India and China were emerging out of um, uh, you know this colonial grip, uh, and they wanted to um, you know have an independent Asia. Um, and so if you look at the Panchil in 1954, if you look at the Bandung conference where both Pandit Nehru and uh, the Chinese Premier Chow and Lai were there, and if you look at that entire you know, period in history, it's a period where you're talking about Hindi Chini Bai Bai and you know, the fraternal relations between India and China. And the view at that point was that the US should not be allowed to interfere in Asia because uh, you know, that is not good for Asian countries. So at this point, uh, it's very much India and China working together to keep great powers out. Of course, the US, but to a certain extent, uh, even the Soviets. But what happens is that shifts very quickly. So if you look at uh, the period since the Sino-Indian border war, uh, 1962, uh, right up to about 1970, um, uh, what you see is it's India and the US versus China, because suddenly, uh, India realizes that China is a threat because of the border conflict and um, uh, you know uh, the traumatic impact that it had on India. Uh, and India moves closer to the US and the US finds that India is suddenly a partner in this great anti-communist enterprise against, uh, against uh, 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 you know, China. And so there is the US military aid following the conflict. And then of course, there is the, uh, the drought and the famines in India because of which you have PL 480 and so on, uh, you know, food aid from the US and so on. So this is one period when uh, you know, it is India and the US together and they are you know, sort of to a certain extent trying to counter, uh, trying to counter China. If we go to the 70s and the 80s, uh, once again, the situation changes. And the situation changes because of the rapprochement between uh, the US and China. So following Nixon's uh, you know, famous visit to, uh, to Beijing and uh, the normalization of relations between the two countries, what happens is that they uh, you know, join hands against the Soviet Union. But also remember for both countries, Pakistan is a close ally. And because Pakistan is a close ally with both countries, and in fact, Pakistan played a big role in in normalizing relations between the US and, uh, and China. What happens is that we move closer to the Soviet Union. So there is the Indo-Soviet Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation. And this alliance between the US and China and also Pakistan and South Asia uh, continues right through the 80s. And uh, of course, this is strengthened because of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and also Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia, which are seen by both the uh, U.S. and Pakistan, and also by China, as a great, um, as a great, uh, as, a, as a as a great threat. So now it is India and China versus the U.S. Now we come to the 90s, uh, and then again the situation uh, is different because uh, the Soviet Union collapses, and both India and China are to a certain extent deeply unsettled at what is happening. For India, of course, there is the loss of a close ally. Uh, for China, uh, there is the big question mark about communism and communist ideology as such. So in China, the great concern is that uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is not uh, going to be able to hold on to power. Will, will uh, the, 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 the government be overthrown? So for example, the Tiananmen Square uh, incidents in 1989 are a big wake up call for China. So China is uncertain. India is uh, uh, has lost its major ally. It is facing an economic crisis in 1991. And this is a period when uh, the US is dominant. Of course, both India and the US are at this point of time still uh, you know, sort of concerned about uh, their own uh, internal problems. So there's not so much of uh, you know working together against the dominance of the US, but there is an understanding that you are you are entering a unipolar world where the US is uh, where the US is uh, the US is uh, the US is powerful, and then of course we come to uh, uh, the 2000s. So if you look at the at the noughties, as it were, the early noughties, 2001 to about 2012, this is again a period where uh, India and China uh, try to uh, somehow. Uh, establish their presence on the international stage, uh, become more prominent. And that, of course, is helped by the 
uh, you know, the BRICS report, uh, the famous BRICS report of 2001, where there is a talk of these, uh, you know, uh, these emerging economies becoming very dominant as far as the world is concerned. So there is the BRICS. This is also the period when trade between India and China is growing because the relationship is improving. China has joined the WTO. Um, and so the trade relations between China and the rest of the world is improving and trade with India is improving. Uh, and of course, in 2008, there is the financial crisis. And following the financial crisis, both India and China realize, or uh, you know, both India and China want to actually improve, uh, 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 you know, uh, sort of um, uh, international financial institutions, and there is this attempt to reform uh, the IMF. But then again, uh, there is a change uh, from around 2011 onwards. And as Kanti said, once President Xi Jinping comes to power. Um, and he begins to assert himself more and more. Uh, what happens is that India and China, uh, you know, draw closer together because they begin to see that there is a threat uh, that is emerging from 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 China. Uh, so there is the uh, growing assertiveness of China internationally and uh, also populist leaders in India and the U.S. who are concerned about uh, this external threat um, and identify China as a potential threat. And that is still the phase that we are in. So one of the points that I wanted to make at the outset is that when you look at it historically, uh, the relationship between the three countries have evolved over a period of time. So uh, you know it is it is something that has evolved. Uh, you know the, the the combinations have changed, but uh, um, uh, uh, but uh, you know all three countries have never had uh, a kind of relationship where all three have cooperated on uh, a major issue. Even though I will, I will uh, come to it towards the end. That is going to be very important. It is important, but it is going to be something that is difficult to difficult to achieve. Okay, so that is the that is the historical context of the of the of the relationship. So now we'll come back to uh, current concerns and how that is impacting the countries internally, and also how the countries view the outside world. So how are uh, uh, or what are the concerns of the of the three countries, and how does it affect the Indo-Pacific region? So, I will start off with China, uh, and I start off with China because uh, I feel, um, you know, China is a is in some ways a country that is misunderstood. Uh, in the sense that uh, I'm not saying that everything China is doing is good, uh, but the problem is that we draw most of our information on China and what China is doing uh, from Western sources. And because we draw it from Western court sources uh, and we don't look at Chinese sources enough, uh, primarily for reasons of language, uh, sometimes because of problems with access, it is the Western perceptions of China which are dominant as far as our thinking of China is concerned. That is a mistake. Uh, that is a big mistake. Um, it is unfortunate, uh, but again, we don't spend enough time uh, looking at China. So one of the important things to recognize is that uh, uh, China, even though it is very big and it is uh, currently seems very aggressive, is also a country that feels very insecure and threatened. Uh, so if you look at uh, it, if you look at the world from Beijing, they see a different world than the world we see when we look at Beijing. So uh, they feel very uh, insecure and threatened, uh, and there are certain reasons for this. Um, the primary reason is economic. Uh, it is not so much, uh, it is geopolitics, of course, but it is also because of China's economic concerns that uh, they feel very, uh, very insecure. Um, and one of the major reasons is that uh, uh, its dependence on oil imports, particularly from the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, are very, very critical for its, uh, for its economy. So when you look at uh, China's oil imports, for example, um, what has happened is that, uh, uh, you know, in the 90s, uh, in the 1990s, in the 20th century, China was actually for some time a net exporter of oil. And then it became an importer of oil because of its economic growth. Um, and uh, in 2017, it overtook the US as the larger importer of oil. So it's dependent quite a lot on uh, you know, oil for its uh, domestic economic uh, for its domestic economic growth, and uh, when you look at uh, its imports, a lot of it come from uh, the Middle East and the Persian Gulf region, um, and this is something that China sees as a major uh, vulnerability. 
So when you look at many Chinese initiatives uh, in terms of the One Belt, One Road initiative um, or the Great Silk Road and so on, a lot of it is to protect its, uh, uh, its, uh, its international trade because China sees uh, itself as threatened in terms of its sea lanes of communication. Uh, so this map, for example, shows you China's sea lanes of communication. So if you look at oil shipping lanes, what you see is that it comes through the Indian Ocean, through the Malacca Straits and goes up the South China Sea. And when China looks at uh, the Pacific, what it sees is, uh, uh, you know, sort of countries which are hostile all along the sea lanes of communication. So one of the great concerns that China has is that um, its economic, uh, uh, its economy might be held hostage by countries which interdicted sea lanes of communication. And remember, it is threatened all throughout. So if you get the oil out of the Persian Gulf, then there is India, then you would go through the Straits of Malacca. So if you look at countries like Singapore, uh, you know, Malaysia and so on, they're closely aligned to the US. So if you go up the South China Sea, there is Philippines, uh, there is Vietnam, and China has historically fought a conflict with Vietnam, there is Philippines. To the north, there is Taiwan, and then to the north of that, there is Japan and South Korea. So when China looks at, uh, uh, you know, where the oil is coming from, uh, it sees, uh, you know, great vulnerabilities, uh, uh, you know, in terms of its sea lanes of communication. And so therefore, um, you know, there is this, uh, there is this deep desire to ensure that uh, you know, its economy is protected by protecting its sea lines of communication. And so it is the presence of uh, U.S. forces in the Indian Ocean and uh, the Western Pacific, uh, plus U.S. bases in Japan, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, some uh, alliances with, uh, with uh, Singapore, with uh, Australia, uh, uh, Japan and so on that 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 raises concerns as far as the as far as the US is concerned as far as China is concerned so that is one great uh, source of concern so this desire to defend itself and the need to access natural resources particularly energy resources um, makes China see its interventions in the uh, Indo-Pacific as defensive rather than offensive action. So this is why um, China always says, uh, look, we are not uh, uh, you know, an aggressive power. We are not an offensive power. What we want is we want a rightful place in the world because we are a major economy and we want to ensure that our interests are protected. Of course, uh, when people see what China is doing in order to protect its interests, uh, you know, it very often doesn't look like uh, 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 you know, that it is defensive. Very often it looks, it looks, very, it looks very offensive. The other aspect of it, of course, is Chinese domestic politics. Um, and since uh, 2011, but particularly, uh, you know, since about uh, 2017, uh, Chinese domestic politics has been, uh, you know, roiled uh, by uh, President Xi Jinping and his attempts to, uh, you know, sort of um, enforce his, uh, his, uh, his authority on, on, on China um, as one of the great leaders of, uh, of, of China. So when you look at Chinese domestic politics, uh, there are two things that are, uh, that are uh, you know, quite uh, you know, significant. One of course is the crackdown on domestic opponents, which has been, which has been quite uh, you know, severe uh, you know, under President Xi. Um, and also its aggressive actions abroad, which has a domestic component to it, which I'll, which I'll come to shortly. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, the focus of President C in terms of uh, both internal and external priorities, there is of course the major anti-corruption campaign, uh, which he used in order to remove many of his domestic, uh, domestic uh, you know, critics or domestic challenges. Um, there is, of course, the Great Firewall of China, which uh, you know sort of ensures that uh, everything that the Chinese citizens see is heavily censored and controlled by the party. Um, there is this attempt to uh, you know to essentially subdue the the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, which is uh, you know again a very um, uh, a kind of determined effort to stamp out Uyghur culture. Um, and externally, of course, there is the intervention in the South China Sea, the seashell of the islands. There is the intervention in Hong Kong, uh, which has recently happened um, with that uh, agreement with UK effectively being, uh, being torn up. And of course, uh, there is the great desire to, uh, to reintegrate Taiwan with, with China. Um, so if you look at President Xi, he has been focused 
more on asserting this control domestically, but also in terms of asserting China's, uh, uh, you know, China's strength abroad. So there are three uh, possible reasons that have been given for this crackdown on dissent, um, and also this very aggressive stance that President Xi Jinping, uh, 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 you know, that Singh has taken ever since he came to power. Uh, the first is that uh, he wants to project himself as the leader who led China to great past status uh, and recognized by the world before important milestones in the Chinese Communist Party's history this year and in 2022. I'll come to those, to those milestone events shortly. I mean, these milestones are important uh, to keep in mind when we look at how the situation is evolving. But what is clear is that he wants to project himself as a leader in the same lines as Mao uh, and President uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, in, that, in, that, in that same image, as the Chinese leader who brought China back onto the world stage and made it a world power. Um, and that uh, you know, sort of project is, 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 is very much underway. So that is one uh, you know, sort of uh, explanation that is given. Uh, the second is that uh, it is related to it, but the second is that uh, China is also actively seeking to confront the US, uh, replace the US as the dominant world power, and aggressive nationalism or assertion abroad is a way of intimidating neighbors into accepting its dominance. Okay, so you are you're trying to scare your neighbors and saying that, uh, okay, we are dominant, we are going to be the, the new great power, the dominant world power. So uh, perhaps it's time you loosen your ties with, with the US and, uh, you know, align more with us. So it's, it's, it's an attempt to, uh, uh, you know, sort of assert itself vis-a-vis -vis the US. Um, it is uncharacteristic of China because traditionally China has always felt, and Deng Xiaoping was very clear on, on, on this, that uh, China should grow quietly and peacefully, and it should assert itself only when it is ready. It should not assert itself too soon, uh, because Deng Xiaoping was concerned that China would be seen as too aggressive, and that would lead to, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 collective action against it by other countries. But President Xi Jinping has, uh, you know, seems to have thrown that caution to the to the wind, and he seems to have asserted his his, his authority. You know. Uh, you know, much more, both internally and uh, and externally. It's uncharacteristic, but uh, the argument is that he feels he has to do it in order to you know to to ensure his place in in, in Chinese history. The third argument that has been given is that uh, this again is a defensive argument that this aggression uh, uh, abroad and uh, uh, you know this strong crackdown on dissent domestically is because the Chinese Communist Party itself uh, is uh, very concerned about uh, its future. Um, and one of the great concerns that it has traditionally had, um, and um, um, uh, you know, it is, you know, uh, not, it is understandable that it has it, is because as China becomes much more, uh, much more richer and much more, uh, uh, you know, people's living standards increase, they are likely to ask for greater political freedom and participation. So remember, very much the same thing happened in Taiwan and South Korea. Uh, they were uh, both very, uh, you know, authoritarian, uh, you know, almost one party dictatorships at one point, but gradually both in Taiwan and South Korea, as the people became much more richer, they began to demand independence and both the countries became democracies. And so one concern that the Chinese Communist Party has is that just like in Taiwan and South Korea, the same thing might happen in China as well, and this is the great, uh, uh, you know, sort of nightmare uh, for the for the for the Chinese Communist Party. So, as far as this argument goes, um, strict censorship and control of private enterprise is essentially part of the, uh, you know, of the uh, of the party's attempt to establish its dominance and prevent any challenge to the existing party uh, party leadership. So, as far as this argument goes, the reason why China is assertive is simply because of the fact that uh, it is concerned about what is going to happen domestically, and it wants to preempt uh, domestic challenges by being both, uh, 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 you know, uh, by both cracking down on dissent internally, but also being aggressive ab abroad, and that leads to nationalist feelings developing at, at, at home.
again, uh, with China, it is very difficult to, uh, to figure out what the real reasons are. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it could be, uh, it is plausible that it's a mixture of all three in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, the Chinese are, the government is concerned about uh, the long-term stability of the country. Uh, and it, but it's also uh, true that they want to reclaim their place in the world as the leading uh, you know, sort of power in the world. And they see uh, the US as one country that is preventing them from achieving uh, you know, that, uh, that objective. Okay, so this is as far as China is concerned. So both domestically and externally, um, as I mentioned, uh, there are certain reasons why they take a certain view as far as the Indo-Pacific region is concerned. So they would argue that it is defensive, uh, but uh, their defensive posture is very often seen as being aggressive by others. Uh, and that, of course, is always a very, very dangerous situation in international affairs. And there are some major dangers to that, which I will, I will, I will come to uh, later on, uh, slightly later on in the, in, the, in the talk as well. And one other point that I wanted to make was that uh, uh, China is also concerned at uh, uh, the growth of private enterprise and uh, major, uh, uh, you know, sort of individuals. Uh, becoming oligarchs like, uh, uh, you know, in Russia. So uh, recently they have also been cracking down on many of these large, uh, you know, e-commerce and other players as well. So for example, if you look at Jack, what happened to Jack Ma and his uh, IPO, um, uh, one, um, uh, you know, sort of view is that uh, the party is asserting itself against these leaders because they see them as potential threats. I mean, again, it's difficult to know to what extent that is true, uh, but uh, if you look at Russia and what the oligarchs did, uh, you know, before Putin, uh, perhaps there is some uh, truth to that, uh, to that, to that belief. Okay, um, what about the U.S.? So I'll talk about the U.S. and then come to uh, India before I talk about uh, what the, some of the challenges for the countries and the region are. Now, of course, under President Trump, relations with the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, sorry, with China deteriorated significantly, primarily because of the trade war and because of Trump's belief that uh, China was essentially acting unfair in terms of trade. Um, initially, there was the expectation that President Trump would come back. And of course, if he had come back, the relationship would have deteriorated significantly. But now that President Biden is in power and President Trump uh, uh, is no longer there, uh, how does uh, the world look from the Oval Office? Uh, so when you look at it from the Oval Office, um, and if you look at President Biden's, uh, uh, you know, sort of outlook uh, towards his, his presidency, uh, of course, it is clear that the major challenges are domestic. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about that. There are major domestic challenges. Uh, but it is also true that there are external commitments that the U.S. cannot withdraw from very quickly, however much it might want. Uh, so it's almost like a country that is trying to, uh, you know, sort of rid itself of the world's problems and focus more domestically, but it realizes that it has made long-term commitments and withdrawing uh, might also have very negative consequences for it uh, in the long run. Um, uh, but there are these major domestic challenges, but also external commitments that President Biden has to be aware of. So the first major challenge, of course, uh, as we all know, is the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so in terms of immediate challenges, securing vaccines, vaccinating, vaccinating fairly and evenly, that is a major challenge. And that is something that he seems to be handling you know, pretty well, much better than uh, you know, many had hoped for, perhaps better than even he had hoped for. Um, uh, so uh, in that sense, uh, that remains a challenge. And of course, uh, one doesn't know where the pandemic is going. We are still in the middle of it. So there is that uncertainty relating to, relating to that as well. But quite apart from that, there are other uh, things on his domestic agenda as well, which are, uh, which are important. So ensuring growth, uh, you know, once you come out, come out of the pandemic, creating jobs, rebuilding race relations, uh, these are uh, likely to be, to be major challenges that are likely to, uh, to keep them occupied. Uh, the other thing that he is looking uh, at, uh, you know, in the medium term, the short to medium term is, of course, uh, the 2022 uh, midterm elections, uh, because there is a bare majority in the House. Uh, there is a majority with the vice president's casting vote in the Senate. 
uh, if that goes, then his entire agenda goes for a, uh, you know, is hit for a six. Uh, so he has to be very, very careful uh, to ensure that uh, he at least maintains the majorities, if possible, increase it. Uh, and that is going to be very, very difficult because remember, President Trump got more votes than even he did in the last election. So uh, it is not going to be easy. Uh, uh, President Trump is around, the Republicans are around. A lot of people are unhappy with what happened. And uh, uh, normally in midterm elections, what happens is that the incumbent party is often badly hit. It's very rarely that they do very well. Uh, so that is something that he's, he, uh, you know, he has to have a focus on. Uh, you know, in the next uh, uh, year uh, and in the first half of next year. But of course, uh, uh, they, he cannot, uh, you know, sort of ignore uh, the rest of the world because the U.S. is such a major player. So in terms of the other challenges, there is the challenge of re-engaging with multilateral institutions and agreements. And there are a whole host of them which President Trump, uh, you know, literally either ignored or, um, or humiliated or left. Uh, so, for example, the World Health Organization, the WTO, NATO, uh, the Paris Convention. I mean, these are all, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, international engagements that, um, uh, you know, uh, President Biden is trying to uh, reestablish uh, and put on an even keel. Uh, so that challenge is there internationally. Uh, the other, of course, is to reassure allies. You know, President Trump was so unilateralist in its approach um, that many U.S. allies grew very concerned about whether they could depend on the U.S. for their security or continued U.S. engagement on uh, economic matters. Um, and one important task, of course, is to convince allies that the U.S. is dependable. It will be with them in the long run, uh, particularly on issues which are important for his domestic agenda as well. So for example, when you look at climate change, that is an important part of the Democratic Party agenda. Um, and uh, uh, you, know, you cannot solve that without engaging with, uh, with other countries. So that, uh, that engagement has to be there. And of course, there is the ever-present threat uh, of uh, you know, these states, which the US sees as a threat. So there is a research in China, there is a research in Russia, there is Iran and North Korea with their missiles and their uh, nuclear programs and so on. So the US has to deal with that. And if they fail to deal with that, then what you will see is uh, countries taking matters into their own hands because they realize that the US is not there to protect them. And then the concern is, for example, uh, of Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, South, South Korea, Japan, and so on, perhaps thinking that uh, it is time for them to acquire, uh, you know, to develop themselves militarily, perhaps acquire nuclear weapons and so on, which will further destabilize, uh, uh, you know, both uh, uh, the region, the Indo-Pacific region, but also the rest of the world. So uh, when you look at it from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, 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 from uh, President Biden's perspective or the US perspective, there are both internal as well as external challenges, which are quite, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite, uh, you know, critical challenges, but also quite difficult challenges to confront. And of course, uh, it remains to be seen, uh, you know, what, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what he will do, and uh, you know, what the results of his actions are as far as these issues are concerned. So, I mean, the next, uh, I mean, his, his entire presidency is going to be a fascinating thing to uh, to, to 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 watch. But there is also uh, a longer term uh, uh, threat um, that the US is, is acutely aware of. And I think uh, a lot of what President Biden is doing is also related to this longer term ideological and economic challenge, uh, which uh, the US is facing, but which many other countries are facing as well. Um, and this is uh, an important uh, issue that we need to keep in mind, because remember, Unlike uh, the Soviet Union, which was primarily an ideological challenge and a military uh, challenge, uh, China is both an ideological challenge and an economic challenge. The Soviet Union never you know, challenged the US economically because its economic model was, um, you know, there were problems with the model from the very beginning and finally, of course, of course they collapsed. But China is quite different. China is quite different. There is an ideological challenge, not the communist challenge, but a different ideological challenge. I'll come to that. And, and there's an economic challenge as well. So economically, it is replacing the US as the world's largest economy. And that is natural because it's one of the, it's the largest uh, uh, you know, country on in earth in terms of population. And its per capita income is, of course, rising uh, quite 
has risen quite dramatically. So it is the largest economy in the world. Um, but uh, uh, there are some fundamental questions which the rise of China has raised, uh, which could affect the US global role uh, uh, you know, in future. And some of these challenges have, have risen uh, in recent years. So I'll talk about three, uh, you know, quickly uh, uh, that are that are important. The first is the democracy challenge. So is an authoritarian China better than the U.S. at handling the pandemic? So does it mean that democracy is not suitable for developing countries? So this is one big question mark. So the Chinese are saying that look, we have proven that democracy is not suitable uh, for many countries because with democracy you cannot handle emergencies like this. Incidentally, um, you know, I've just finished another paper where I look at how uh, you know different countries have handled the pandemic and uh, one of the things that i conclude is that uh, you know it doesn't matter whether you are a democracy or an authoritarian country both can handle pandemics very effectively this is this is actually a false debate in a sense but the world over that is this question is being asked and china is actually act actively promoting it saying that um, russia as well saying that you know strong governments are needed otherwise you know you can't handle major uh, emergencies the second is the economic challenge so will Trump's trade war and technology transfer restrictions, uh, 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 you know, uh, as far as uh, uh, China is concerned, uh, will that lead to uh, China itself developing technology, uh, moving faster in terms of technology development, perhaps by stealing the technology and try and will that result in a narrowing of the US technological lead? I mean, there is some concern that China is putting a huge effort into developing, uh, you know, uh, uh, chips, for example, um, into uh, microprocessors and so on. Um, and the attempt is to uh, replace, uh, you know, uh, chips which were made in the US with Chinese made one. So uh, one concern is that uh, this trade war will only hasten the Chinese challenge. Uh, the third is the global challenge. So will the US be able to protect its allies in the, uh, uh, in the uh, Western Pacific and uh, in the other regions? Against, uh, uh, against China. So can you protect Taiwan against China, Japan and South Korea against North Korea, uh, ASEAN countries against Chinese occupation of islands in the South China Sea. So this is a challenge. If you are not able to do that, uh, then the countries will, uh, will, will feel that, uh, you know, they are being left at the mercy, uh, being left at the mercy of the, of the, of the, uh, of uh, the great local hegemon, which is China and countries might decide that you know, we might as well patch up with China and uh, develop closer relations with it. And that is the that is the great concern. OK, so finally, let us come to uh, come to India and look at, uh, uh, you know, where does India fit into this into this picture as far as the larger uh, Indo-Pacific region is, is concerned. So if you look at India's external challenges, um, uh, if you look at the current uh, Indian government, uh, the current government has placed a great emphasis on national security ever since it came to power in 2014. Uh, because one of its um, arguments has been that, again, you need a very strong government in order to deal with external challenges. Um, the great emphasis earlier was on Pakistan. Um, and, you know, one must uh, accept that it has dealt with Pakistan successfully, uh, but it has come at a cost. And that cost, uh, you know, is of course something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that the government is aware of, uh, and of course is trying to meet. Uh, but uh, uh, remember, uh, there are long run, uh, you know, implications of that as well. So what is the cost? The cost, of course, is that uh, um, uh, as India has, uh, you know, become uh, a lot more assertive, Sino-Pakistan relations are stronger than ever. And President Xi uh, has emphasized his relationship with Pakistan both to develop an alternative land route to the sea uh, and also to constrain uh, India in its neighborhood. So uh, the Chinese attempt in terms of their relationship with Pakistan has always been to keep India tied down to the South Asian region. And, uh, uh, you know, so therefore this, this alliance makes, uh, makes, makes sense. So if you look at the One Belt, One Road initiative or the China-Pakistan economic corridor, both are major challenges because this is bringing China closer to, uh, you know, into South Asia itself. So if you look at uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative, for example, uh, I mean, uh, China is trying to develop a road, uh, you know, a land link uh, to Europe, uh, which is different from the old one. Uh, but remember, it's also trying to develop a sea link, uh, uh, you know, uh, so it becomes a kind of uh, 
alternate, uh, you know, sort of route uh, to vulnerable sea lanes of communication. Uh, but remember, Pakistan is also a very integral part of it because one of the things that China is trying to do is develop land links, uh, you know, between China and uh, 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 the Indian Ocean through Pakistan. So in terms of this huge investments that they have made uh, in developing transport infrastructure, the idea is to develop an alternative land route uh, into Pakistan in order to reduce the vulnerability of the sea lanes of communication. So what this has done is, um, uh, you know, of course it, is, it has brought China closer, uh, China into South Asia. And one of the great concerns that India has is that uh, this greater involvement of China in South Asia and uh, Chinese investments in Pakistan complicate any attempt to uh, you know, to uh, to deal with Pakistan itself because China is now intricately linked with Pakistan. Of course, I I do realize there are problems with the with the uh, China Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, there have been all kinds of issues relating to loans and so on. But uh, Pakistan is very very closely aligned to China, and uh, that alliance is not going to break anytime soon. Um, and uh, you know, Pakistan feels that it needs China in order to deal with uh, uh, an assertive India. Uh, now. For India, the close relationship with the Trump administration was the linchpin of India's engagement with the West. So, for example, if you look at the Prime Minister and President Trump, they had a very close relationship, uh, uh, you know, not just in terms of uh, you know, bilateral relations, but also a close relationship which, uh, which sort of um, spilled into domestic politics as well. So, for example, if you look at, you know, uh, President Modi's, uh, you know, Trump, uh, you know, uh, and so on and all those slogans and so on there was an attempt to uh, uh, you know to 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 get involved in domestic politics in two, the two countries as well and the government of course placed a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on developing this close relationship with the trump administration um it was also critical to facing up to the challenge posed by chinese intervention in south asia so there was a reason why this relationship uh, you know was close uh, quite apart from the personal uh, chemistry between the three countries. Uh, but President Biden's victory in the 2020 elections, uh, you know, did raise concerns over the future of the relationship uh, because Democratic uh, congressmen, particularly, uh, you know, the Vice President uh, Kamala Harris um, and Pramila Jaipal and so on, many of them had raised concerns about the revocation of Article 370, press freedom and so on. Uh, so one of the concerns was that, uh, you know, perhaps we had, Put too much of our, you know, place too much of our, uh, uh, of our uh, dependence on President Trump and him coming back to power. But when that did not happen, perhaps the relationship would 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 deteriorate. Um, but uh, I think, fortunately for us, um, uh, what it appears like, uh, and there is, by the way, there's an article that President Professor Pathore and myself have written. Um, which appeared in the ET last week on this on this relationship. Um, so, uh, and one of the things that we say in the article is that uh, there are three reasons why the Indo-US relationship is likely to grow stronger, despite these you know problems uh, uh, you know between the Democratic Party and uh, the view within the Democratic Party that uh, you know there are some concerns relating to where India is heading. Uh, the first, of course, is geopolitics, uh, and this is what is likely to bring, uh, you know, the two countries closer together. So there is a realization in the U.S. and among its allies that, uh, you know, China is a long-term uh, threat, not just economically, but ideologically as well, in terms of this authoritarian uh, authoritarian government versus democracy kind of kind of debate. And so what you need to confront China in the Indo-Pacific and Russia in uh, Europe is a coalition of democracies acting to promote democratic values. Uh, so for uh, the US, uh, India is quite important. So uh, uh, India is important because it would be a critical partner. So if you look at the recent Quad meeting where uh, uh, US, India, Japan and Australia got together, and it was decided that uh, the US and Japan will pay for India to make the vaccines. Uh, almost 1 billion doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that would be you know, distributed by Australia. That is one attempt to counter China, and also to a certain extent Russia. So uh, essentially, India is very critical for the US at the moment, because uh, in the larger scheme of things, this relationship is going to be very, very important for, uh, for uh, uh, the US, and 
many other democratic countries around the world. And it's also in India's interest as well. Uh, the second is US domestic politics. Um, uh, so President Trump's uh, very aggressive actions against China were very popular among his working class uh, you know, supporters. So if you look at blue collar workers and so on, they essentially blame China for low wages and loss of jobs in manufacturing. And remember, these voters are not going to uh, uh, go anywhere. They are there. And uh, any move on the part of Biden administration to improve relations with China uh, would essentially be seized by the Republicans uh, uh, and Republican candidates in midterm elections in 2022. And this is something that uh, you know the Democratic Party and President Biden are very aware of, which is why uh, they have maintained their aggressive stance as far as China is concerned. They have not eased off, uh, whether it be the trade war or on issues of technology or on issues of human rights. If anything, they have actually been much more aggressive in terms of dealing with China, particularly in terms of imposition of sanctions relating to the uh, to Chinese actions in Xinjiang and so on. Um, so again, uh, for purely political reasons, you are likely to see um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the relationship improving. Uh, also, there is another reason. Uh, remember, it would be very popular among Indian American voters as well. Um, and they are important. Uh, they are an important factor in elections. So for example, the Indian diaspora is now quite large. It's about 4.4 million strong. Uh, the Chinese diaspora is about 5 million. So they are an important, uh, you know, sort of domestic, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, group, uh, community, which, uh, you know, you could, uh, you know, sort of pull in by developing this relationship with, 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 with India. The third, of course, is the trade relationship. Uh, so, for example, if you look at uh, the bilateral trade relationship, uh, you know, in 2019, it reached about 149 billion. The number of Indian students in the U.S. has uh, increased quite significantly. And another interesting, uh, you know, fact uh, that last year, uh, sorry, last month, uh, uh, the U.S. replaced Saudi Arabia as the second largest exporter of crude oil to India. Uh, Iraq is still the largest, but now the U.S. is a very important uh, exporter of crude oil to India because India is trying to reduce its dependence on the Persian Gulf and uh, the U.S. is replacing it. So that economic relationship is important both for the U.S. and for India, particularly because uh, the U.S. is now a net exporter of, uh, of, uh, of energy and India is keen to you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, move away from uh, the Gulf as far as uh, its oil imports are concerned. So for these three reasons, uh, despite other irritants in the relationship, those irritants are likely to be minor and you're likely to see a much, much stronger relationship between the US and India, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, you know, all, I would suggest almost as strong as the relationship that you had under President Trump. Huh? So, so that is something that you are, uh, that you are, uh, that you are likely to see. Okay, so just to sum up, um, uh, uh, you know, what is it that you are likely to see happening? So uh, the three countries together uh, have a combined population of about 3 billion, uh, you know, and it is just cost 3 billion. And ideally, they should be working together to address global issues. So for example, if you look at uh, climate change, if you look at uh, pandemics, if you look at terrorism, if you look at the whole issue of technology standards, technology regulation and so on, I mean, these three countries need to work very closely together. But the problem is, as I mentioned, historically, the three countries have never worked closely together. It is always two countries which have worked against uh, the third. Uh, and I, I don't see that uh, you know, changing any uh, time in the near future. So it is this Chinese dominance of the Indo-Pacific uh, that will, uh, growing dominance that will dictate geopolitical alignments in the region in the near to medium term. And this will bring India and the US and its allies in the region, uh, in the region closer together. Uh, the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that uh, tensions with China are likely to increase uh, both this year and next year because we are approaching very important milestones. Uh, there are some milestones we need to be, to be aware of. So for example, uh, in July of this year, it's the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party and they are planning a big, 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 you know, sort of campaign or a big celebration saying that China has, you know, has arrived on the world stage. Uh, next year, it's the 75th anniversary of Indian and Pakistani independence. We are celebrating 75 years of independence in 2022. In November next year, October or November, we don't know exactly which month, usually uh, recent party congresses have been around this time, we'll have the 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. And remember, this is the 
this is the uh, Congress where President Xi Jinping will get a third term or is supposed to get a third term, which is quite unprecedented because traditionally since Deng Xiaoping, all leaders have held only two terms. So he's going to get, a, he's trying for a third term and uh, he's going to be very, very, uh, you know, sort of careful to see that his image does not deteriorate over the next one year. And on top of that, of course, you have US midterm elections in November 22, where, as I mentioned, uh, the US president will try to, uh, you know, uh, retain his, uh, his majorities in both the House and the Senate. Now, um, why are these anniversaries important? These anniversaries are important primarily because none of these three governments will want to appear weak at this time. Huh? So the last thing you want to do is you don't want to go into your 100th anniversary or your 75th anniversary or your uh, you know, midterm elections trying to appear weak. So the danger is essentially that uh, you will not be able to control tensions because you are taking positions which uh, will strengthen you domestically. Uh, because you are looking at your domestic audience and feeling that I cannot be seen to be weak at this time. And so what you might see is that either there are local tensions or clashes which go out of control, uh, like the ones that happened on the Sino-Indian border recently, or it could be some incident in the, in the Pacific region, or there's a miscalculation uh, on, on some side. So for example, one uh, con great concern in the US is that the Chinese might actually invade Taiwan. They feel that they are now strong enough to resist the US and they might invade China, uh, Taiwan. I mean, the US believes that in the next five years, uh, China might try to invade and, and uh, you know, reintegrate Taiwan with, uh, with uh, China like it did with Hong Kong. Uh, so the great danger I think is that, uh, uh, you know, we are entering a phase that is, that is uh, you know, very uncertain. And what you might see is that uh, this larger uh, you know, challenges which are economic and political, leading to a situation where there is instability because of uh, uh, some, uh, you know, because of these of these uh, of these anniversaries and these domestic political compulsions that uh, the leaders of the three countries are, are are involved with. Okay, so that is where I will I will I will end. Uh, and uh, now I think I've taken slightly five minutes more than I should have, uh, but I would be uh, you know sort of happy to take questions uh, uh, you know on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's been a wonderful talk and I think it's a wonderful extensive account of the relations between these three countries uh, historically. Uh, so now I invite the questions from uh, the audience. Uh, you you can either, yes, uh, Professor Chetan Joshi is here. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Hi, Biju. Good evening. Good, good evening. Yeah. How would you see, uh, like, if we look at eastwards from India, say near Pacific, near shore is Hong Kong, and a little bit far shore, we can say Australia. Um, Hong Kong already, China has done something, and Australia and China over the last year, post the pandemic, have had tensions. And that's why the Quad Initiative might have been critical also. So any thoughts on China, Hong Kong, China, Australia relationship? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in terms of China and Hong Kong, um, uh, see, to a certain extent, that uh, that attempt by people in Hong Kong to reassert, to assert their independence and to say that we are different from China. We are democratic. We have a different history. Uh, we are different in terms of how we govern ourselves independently and we should be treated differently. That debate has, uh, has more or less ended uh, because what China has, to a certain extent, done is made Hong Kong part of China, even though it is not, uh, you know, publicly saying that. Uh, but also remember uh, what China has done is uh, China has given up on any hope that Taiwan will reintegrate peacefully. And this Hong Kong model would be applicable to Taiwan as well. So one of the hopes that many Chinese leaders had in the 80s and 90s was that Taiwan would look at Hong Kong and say, this one country, two systems could work for Taiwan as well. So you can be part of China, but you can be internally democratic. You can have uh, extensive economic relations, but you can maintain your own system. We are not insisting that you have to be you have to follow the Chinese Communist Party. You can follow your internal system, but uh, uh, you, know, you can still be part of China. Now, what President Xi Jinping has done with Hong Kong is he is essentially saying, I don't believe this. 
I don't want two systems. I want only one system. And Hong Kong and Taiwan have to be part of that. And he feels that uh, now China is strong enough that he can enforce it. It doesn't matter what other countries say about what we do in Hong Kong, we will do what we want. Uh, if necessary, we will reintegrate Taiwan by force because President Xi Jinping has said that if Taiwan declares independence, uh, we will invade. And he has said, I'm not ruling out military options. Um, so with regard to Hong Kong, I think that one country, two systems experiment has failed. Even if there was to be a change in leadership in China, uh, I don't think uh, people would trust China any longer in Taiwan uh, to be able to, you know, think of, uh, you know, rejoining the mainland. And in Taiwan, many people are saying that perhaps we should declare independence because as many of you would know, um, Taiwan at the moment, official policy is that it is still part of China, but we should be ruling the whole of China. Of course, that, is, that doesn't make any sense, but that's the official policy. With regard to Australia, again, uh, you see, uh, the economic relationship is very important because uh, a lot of Australia's natural resource exports, commodities, particularly coal, iron ore, uh, you know, a lot of it is going to China. So it is uh, economically very important for Australia. But Australia has major concerns. Uh, and remember, Australia has always had this concern as far as uh, China is concerned. Incidentally, in between, uh, sometime in the 80s, they had this concern with India as well. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the concern, it seems very strange. The concern is that uh, China and India might expand into Australia because Australia is a large country with a very small population. So somehow, uh, you know, these you know, Australia is very vulnerable. Uh, and unless it is... It is closely tied to the US, uh, Japan, and other democratic countries. It will be sort of overrun by China. Um, so while it has been economically dependent, uh, it has also tried to assert its independence from China and maintain the security relationships. And that is what has, uh, 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 that is what has led to problems with, uh, uh, with, with China. It's a very difficult balancing act for them. Uh, but my sense, uh, you know, my own sense is that, uh, 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 you know, Australia is still concerned about uh, uh, Chinese uh, ambitions in the, in the Pacific region, uh, the South Pacific region, and therefore it will remain aligned uh, and work closely with the US, Japan, India, and other democracies, uh, uh, despite its, uh, its, uh, its economic links with China. So that uh, relationship also is going to face, uh, you know, significant uh, uh, heavy weather. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have okay. a question from Prabal Gupta. Prabal, yeah, please okay, go sorry. ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, Prabal, you can, you can go ahead, yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah. so, so my question is that uh, how do you view the uh, military skirmishes uh, India has had with China at Doklam and at Kalwan? Uh, yeah. part of this relationship between these two countries? Is it just military rivalry or is it part of a broader strategy? Uh, yeah. Uh, again, it is it is very very difficult to uh, difficult to actually figure out why this happened. Uh, and I'll and I'll, I'll I'll just tell you why it is so difficult to figure out. Um, um, you see, there is some evidence that when China has been aggressive externally, uh, part of it is due to problems internally in China itself. Uh, so, for example, there is one argument that, for example, the even the Indo-China war in 62 was part of a past struggle within China itself. So what happens is either a, uh, you know, a, a, a leader tries to be uh, aggressive externally in order to shore up domestic support, or sometimes it is done by others who want to embarrass the leader. Okay, so if you have a conflict and something goes wrong, then the leader is embarrassed. So some, some, so one, one, you know, sort of argument is that uh, perhaps this was not uh, the outcome, or this was not something that was designed. Perhaps this was more to do with some past struggle within China. We do not know. We do not know. The other argument is that uh, remember, India has been putting tremendous pressure on Pakistan. And the Chinese have always uh, realized that uh, uh, Pakistan is very good because it keeps India tied to South Asia. So whenever it looks as if India is trying to, or India is asserting its dominance over Pakistan, or Pakistan is becoming, uh, you know, sort of hemmed in by too much Indian pressure, uh, the Chinese do try to reduce pressure by creating problems along the border. Sometimes they, earlier they used to do it in the Northeast as well, supporting insurgencies in the Northeastern region. 
um, even both in, in 65 during the war with Pakistan and in 71, the Chinese did move divisions into Xinjiang and close to the borders with India uh, in order to keep India occupied and not focus all its forces on the Pakistani side of the border. So it could or it could be because of the fact that they want to you know put India off balance. So this is an attempt at showing India that look, uh, you know, don't put too much pressure on Pakistan because we can also create problems for you. And so it's a, it's a way of, you know, keeping us tied down, you know, in South Asia so that we don't play a larger role right? because that is one thing they don't want. Um, so, uh, so as I always say, uh, China doesn't want to be, uh, you know, the U.S.'s, uh, India to be the U.S.'s Pakistan, you know, in the region because its concern is, uh, U.S. will use us like they are using Pakistan. Yeah? So, so that is that is one uh, one uh, uh, possibility. The third possibility is that this is part of President Xi's larger aggressiveness abroad. Uh, he is essentially passing the message that look, we are dominant in the region. We are, now we are back as a great power, and uh, you know you need to uh, you need to uh, you know listen to us. Uh, and uh, uh, this could be a way of being aggressive externally in order to shore up his domestic position as he comes up to the party congress next year. Um, it's a very, uh, I would say, a very risky uh, thing to do uh, because one of the other things that we need to realize about China is that leadership changes can be very, very sudden. Uh, look at how the gang of four, you know, sort of overnight they disappeared. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, so don't be surprised. Don't be very surprised if before the next party congress you suddenly see uh, you know, a major change in leadership in China itself, because internally, uh, apparently there is a major purge of the security forces that are going on at this point of time. This is what we are hearing. Uh, he's trying to reassert himself more. Uh, I mean, as if he had not reasserted himself already. So there is a possibility that, uh, 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 you know, you might see internal instability in China. Perhaps China is not as strong as we think it is. Uh, historically that has happened, so it's possible that it will happen. Uh, but to answer your question, um, it is very difficult to know. I mean, China is, is, is a very difficult country to understand in that sense. So we really, uh, I don't think anybody understands. Different people are giving different reasons as to why they are doing it. It could be a sign of strength. It could be a sign of weakness as well. Uh, we just we just don't know. Yeah. Thank um, you, sir. I think had a question. Yeah, yes. Kirti had a question. Yeah, you can come online and ask. I mean, I know you put it in the, in the. Uh, is your if your audio is working? Uh, yes, sir. thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, please go ahead. Uh, if I understood, uh, I mean, I'm not a specialist on China, and but uh, even Macau was under Portuguese rule, like Hong so, Kong yeah. was under That's British, it. and yeah. the agreement with the Portuguese government was similar to the one that British government had. That yeah. when Macau comes back to China, they will yeah. have a one system, one country. But yes. uh, Macau was assimilated much more easily than yes. Hong Kong has been assimilated. So why yeah. is it China is facing so much trouble in Hong Kong and it didn't face it in Macau? Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. So in fact, uh, uh, the Macau model is the one that President Xi Jinping would like because Macau sort of integrated into China without too many problems. And there is a reason why it developed differently. Remember, Hong Kong was a British colony, whereas Macau was a Portuguese colony. Um, the British, in terms of the institutions and the systems that they built in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is also much larger, uh, you know, in terms of population, it is it is it is much larger as well, and uh, uh, it is also economically, uh, uh, you know, much more integrated with the rest of the world. So one of the things that uh, Hong Kong had was uh, the British legal system, uh, a kind of democratic, uh, you know, sort of government, uh, similar uh, common law, a common law system. Um, you know, similar rights as was available to British citizens. So essentially what Britain tried in Hong Kong was Britain tried to, you know, uh, put in place uh, the British system of government, British democracy, British law, British rules, British courts, uh, you know, the freedom of the press, all that they tried to put into, into Hong Kong. And to a large extent, they succeeded. Now, uh, China also realized that, uh, is, uh, that Hong Kong had a different system of government. Its people were used to democracy, deciding their governments, used to having a role in who would govern them. Um, and of course, they were used to uh, international trade and commerce. Um, so um, uh, the historical differences in terms of how Hong Kong and Macau evolved, uh, you know, plays a major role in 
explaining why the two countries are different in terms of how they view this integration with China. Uh, Macau was always, uh, so if you, when you look at Macau, what is Macau well known for? It is essentially well known for its, uh, uh, for its uh, gambling and its, uh, you know, it's essentially a place where the rich Chinese came to gamble even earlier um, and uh, essentially have a, have a good time. So it was just primarily, e economy-wise, it was certainly not similar to Hong Kong in terms of, uh, uh, you know, its stock market, its financial, um, uh, you know, system and so on. Hong Kong in that sense was much, much more globalized uh, from the very beginning. Um, and for, of course, for a long time was, uh, was a key part of, uh, uh, was a very key part of, uh, of uh, 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 you know, Hong Kong's, uh, uh, oh, sorry, China's relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, uh, so, in that sense, Hong Kong was significantly different. But uh, different. But I would argue that it is the uh, it is the different evolution historically and the differences in terms of the colonial power and how they saw their colony uh, that uh, explains to a large extent the differences, uh, you know, between between Hong Kong and. and so Professor Balram uh, has a question next. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Hi. Hi, Balram. Hi, Biju. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't <laughs> listen to the whole thing. I I somehow saw the message only at six forty-five or so. Uh, okay. 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 No yeah. yeah. So uh, it was whatever I heard was very interesting. So one question I had since uh, the discussion seems to be a lot on China. Uh, it looks like, at least going by what the Western media says, it looks like the current regime, the Xi regime, is also invoking a lot of ancient China glory. Uh, so, which was probably not what uh, Mao and many others did. They were, in fact, trying to dismantle the, uh, the ancient yeah. stuff. Uh, is that just a Western interpretation or is that how it is actually happening? So, in a way, it is like a... Uh, it is like a bringing together of everything. That is, if you look at an ideology span mm -hmm. of uh, leftism to, to often these type of things come under that rightist uh, argument, isn't yeah. it? That Asian glory and a great yeah. civilization and all that. I, is there a truth to this or is just a Western? Uh, is it a Western? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, let me, um, um, uh, you know, um, 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 say this. Um, while China has always uh, believed in itself as, uh, uh, you know, especially since uh, the Communist Party's victory in 1949, it has viewed itself as a global power in ideological terms. Uh, in terms of its economic position and in terms of its global role, uh, China has always had uh, what we call the Middle Kingdom complex. I mean, the Middle Kingdom is complex is essentially says that China is the center of the world. We are the most important power of the world. And, you know, essentially there are these other countries which are kind of satellites or vassals around it. You know? So um, even in Mao's time uh, or in Deng Xiaoping's time, even though the party did not talk about it all that much, um, there was always this, this feeling of humiliation by the West, which happens, you know, happened since the opium wars, this long years of, uh, colonial rule, the very brutal occupation of Japan. And there was this feeling that China had to reassert its power in the world and become a global power once again. Um, so under uh, Mao and President Deng Xiaoping, uh, this history was not invoked all that much, but in terms of Chinese behavior to the rest of the world, um, there was always at the back of the mind this view that we are destined to be great once again. Okay, with President Xi Jinping, uh, there has been a slight difference, and uh, to a certain extent, it is very similar to what has happened in two other countries uh, where the same thing is happening. One is Russia. Uh, of course, in Russia, President Putin invokes, um, you know, the glory of the Tsars. Uh, and if you, if you look at Russia, for example, Russia has nationalism, 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 nationalism and ultra nationalism, yeah, nationalism, ultra nationalism. The Orthodox Church, he places quite a lot of emphasis on the Orthodox Church. He's very religious, even though he, you know, he grew up in the Communist Party. He's very religious now. So he ultra nationalism, you know, Orthodox Christianity as opposed to Catholic and Protestant Christianity. Um, you know, this Tsarist uh, Russia, which is 
you know, dominant both in Europe and Asia. So that that nationalistic image is something that Putin has been trying to develop. And of course, in India, we know that you know again there is this 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 uh, this appeal to a uh, to uh, you know past glory and and uh, trying to reinvoke its position, uh, uh, you know, to sort of reimagine India in a, in, a, in a different light as dominant, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, in its region and a major uh, global player as it as it once was. Uh, so. Uh, very much the same thing is happening in, in, in China. So in fact, um, uh, you know, this new nationalism that you see uh, is uh, somewhat similar in China, Russia, India, and you could say even under President Trump. So if you look at President Trump and you look at his appeal, uh, you know, his, his barely disguised appeal to white nationalism and so on. It is, uh, uh, you know, it is essentially harking back to an old age when immigrants were not there. It was primarily you know, European settlers and so on, that he is also looking uh, looking to. So in a sense, whether you're coming from the left or the right, uh, there is this desire to reassert old civilizational identities and values. Um, and that is something that you're seeing in all these four countries. Uh, and so uh, you're absolutely right. This is something that is happening in, in, in China as well. Uh, it is happening in Russia, it's happening in India, it has happened in the US, there is no guarantee that it will not happen again. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what it reminds us of is uh, what Samuel Huntington said at the end of the Cold War. I mean, what he said was that, uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, there'll be a clash of civilizations. I mean, you will not get global cooperation now, there'll be a clash of civilization. And there were these nine, you know, civilizations that he identified. Uh, and essentially, that is what we are, we are seeing playing out. Uh, and this nationalistic surge that we are seeing, uh, I don't see any evidence that it is it is declining, despite temporary setbacks uh, that they face, for example, in, in 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 the U.S. elections and so on. But in the long run, uh, my sense is that 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 uh, that appeal to past glory uh, is something that will remain, uh, uh, and this has become much more pronounced after the end of the Cold War. And essentially what is happening is that we are going back to the kind of uh, uh, situation that we had, uh, you know, of, you know of, uh, the growth of nationalism since uh, uh, Napoleon and, uh, you know, the growth of nationalism in Europe. So, so that is very much, uh, you know, something that we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, in a historical context. And one could argue that this Cold War was actually an aberration in, 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 in history in the sense that, that was a time when it was ideological. So you had two blocks, but now we are going back to what was there uh, in the uh, 19th and early 20th century. It's essentially, uh, you know, real politics, countries, you know, fighting with each other, um, you know, religion, civilization, culture, language, all that becoming important. And I think that is not something to go away. Uh, that's not that's not something that will go away very easily. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, so, Min. Uh, Kranti, I yeah, have yeah. one in case nobody else has anything else. Yes, yeah. please go ahead, Kranti. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, this is a continuation to my previous question. Mm -hmm. Now, Hong Kong, uh, like you had mentioned, was much more integrated into the global financial economy. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, um, global financial system. And uh, unlike uh, Macau, which was primarily based on tourism and uh, casinos and gambling. Oh, yeah. So it, in a way, is kind I mean, I would expect that if there is any disturbance in Hong Kong, it would impact China to a great extent because a lot of Chinese companies access the financial system through Hong Kong, raise funds through the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, would this I mean... Would the government have, have considered this and still gone ahead with what they are doing, or was this yeah. something they did not consider? Yeah, this is a this is a this is a very interesting question. This is a, a very very important question, and and also I think it uh, tells us a lot about uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, because uh, what many in the UK and many in Hong Kong and many uh, in other Western countries thought was that Hong Kong was so important for China especially for Chinese firms, which, uh, you know, used to list in Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong was very important for rerouting investments through Hong Kong into China and so on, that the Chinese would never intervene. And this was also something that the Hong Kongers themselves believed, that we could actually 
demand quite a lot of things because china will never crack down in the way that uh, they have cracked down on their own citizens within 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 china so what changed what changed um so what changed is two things one is uh, china became you know very big economically and so even for firms that were based in hong kong particularly if you look at large hong kong banks if you look at uh, you know many other firms that were based there uh, many of them couldn't afford to lose the chinese market so at some point the chinese government seems to have made the determination that uh, uh, look uh, we are more important for hong kong than hong kong is important for us so even if we intervene and we crack down in hong kong the businessmen will come around okay there is some evidence that it has happened so if you look at uh, the criticism of many british firms and uh, especially hsbc uh, uh, one of the criticism in the west has been that western firms are not uh, uh, you know um, uh, you know sort of talk you know speaking out against what china has done in hong kong and the reason western firms are not speaking out is because they don't want to lose the huge chinese market i mean you know they they, they lose it uh, you know that is going to hurt them uh, very significantly um, especially after the pandemic uh, and because china is growing whereas many of the other countries are not doing so well economically uh, hong kong becomes even uh, sorry china becomes even more important um, so at some point the chinese government seems to have taken this decision that even if we crack down it will it might hurt us a bit economically but the situation is different from what it was uh, let us say in the 90s or the early 2000s the balance has tilted heavily in our favor um uh, and that is possibly the reason why hong kong is facing the kind of challenge it is facing now uh but again as i mentioned um perhaps we have not seen the end of the story because we somehow tend to assume that okay they have subdued hong kong hong kong will remain quiet and then you know things will continue like this perhaps we have not seen the end of it because uh, it is possible that in china people are asking questions and saying look we have we have become too aggressive we could have integrated taiwan peacefully by allowing them a different system by doing this in hong kong we have actually you know squandered that opportunity so even if we have to integrate taiwan now we have to do it by force now if there is that feeling within within china and perhaps if that feeling leads to uh, a situation where uh, let us say uh, you know there is a challenge to presidency emerging uh, it is possible that we could see uh, uh, you know uh, a regime change in china itself um, and uh, a different attitude both to hong kong and to taiwan and also to the rest of the world uh, as i mentioned earlier these sudden changes in in leadership is not something new to china it is it has happened quite often in china's history and uh, so i am not so sure that uh, uh, presidency is as strong as we think he is i mean nobody is as strong as we think they are and nobody is as weak as weak as we think they are and that's usually the case so uh, so uh, my sense is that perhaps the situation might change uh, it is just that we don't know we are we are we are just in the in the middle of it but to answer your question clearly the, the, the short answer is at this point they have decided that uh, the firms need them more than they need hong kong uh, and and that's why they are intervening so thank you uh, i i think i just have one question and perhaps we can yes. end with that uh, so so when we are talking about how domestic politics also shape and the ideology of the incumbent governments also change uh, or influence the relation with the other countries right so in that case now uh, isn't india moving or under the bjp government trying to move towards more authoritarianism in the sense when we are talking when you were talking about the crackdown of dissent when similar to china and we have been hearing that india uh, as a system is trying to become uh, more like china so in that case when we are talking about a, a coalition between Demo when us wants to forge a coalition between Demo democratic countries uh, yeah. so how would it be possible and uh, another thing so when um, such a coalition is tried to uh, be forced upon uh, all democracies together and then so will it lead to a situation like maybe world if not cold war uh, going yeah. back uh, the growing nationalism growing imperialism can it lead to yeah. something like 
another world war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 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 uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. So, uh, so, in a sense, uh, while we call it a coalition of democracies, uh, I mean, we call it a coalition of democracies, but there are concerns about uh, democracy in many of these countries as well. So, for example, uh, you know, not just in India. For example, if you look at the Economist Democracy Index, the U.S. is also a flawed democracy. You know, U.S. is also not these days considered to be a democracy. So in, in that sense, there are concerns relating to democracy and dem democratic rights in uh, many of the countries which are part of this, of this democratic coalition. Uh, but remember, at the end of the day, uh, democracy is one aspect of it. Free markets, free trade, that is one aspect of it. Uh, but also uh, remember, there is a very, uh, what should we say, hardcore real politic at the, at the, at the end of it. So uh, this talk about democracy is at one level of sugar coating. Essentially, what you want to do is you want to stand up against the expansion of China. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether countries are, you know, uh, very good democracies, perfect democracies, whether they are regressing as far as democracy is concerned, that really does not matter. To the extent that uh, these are countries which hold regular elections and uh, you know to that extent are democratic, yes, these are all these are all uh, these are all democratic countries. But um, this democracy is also um, uh, you know sort of couched within larger discourses of nationalism, uh, and those discourses are not very inclusive or national or democratic in nature. Uh, so very often these discourses are very authoritarian in nature in terms of forcing certain views on people. Um, but again, we need to understand uh, that partly it is defensive. Uh, partly it is defensive. So for example, in India, there is a feeling that look, uh, when you look at uh, the people of the country, we have to defend our country because we cannot go anywhere else. So if you look at it civilizationally, uh, you know, there is the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, then there is the, uh, uh, the large Islamic group which are surrounding us, then there is Russia, there is the West, but we are nowhere. We don't have, you know, we don't have a homeland. That's, so so we need, so we, we don't say that we are, uh, so, uh, you know, it is important that we, that we protect that civilization and that, and that, and that culture. So it partly it is defensive, it is not offensive in, offensive in nature. So as Huntington says, when the world becomes very uncertain, people withdraw to their civilizational identities. Huh? And when you withdraw to civilizational identities, what goes out of the window very often is inclusion, democracy. You don't want to involve everybody because you're, you're, you're keen to, to, uh, to assert a, a, certain, a certain line. At the moment, uh, these democracies find it convenient to, uh, to uh, you know, cooperate with each other because China is a greater threat. Uh, but it may not, uh, you know, be the case forever. So, for example, uh, there is a lot of concern in Southeast Asia over Japanese rearmament. There is a lot of uh, you know uh, concern over uh, um, uh, you know the U.S. once again becoming very dominant and in intervening in, in in Southeast Asia. So, uh, just because of China, it does not necessarily mean that the Quad or this coalition of democracies will remain united. It is possible that there are uh, if China is dealt with. Or let's say there are internal problems in China because of China becomes weak. We can see this. We may, may see this coalition once again, once again uh, deteriorating. Um, so one of the things that we see is that uh, these alliances are changing very, very frequently. I mean, historically, also that's been the case, but we are seeing these alliances changing quite frequently uh, these days as well. Um, and so uh, and that is why you know this is such an interesting uh, thing to keep track of because you are you you know you are seeing this unfold in, in, in front of your eyes. Um, and of course, because of the pandemic, it is as if everything has been, uh, has been kind of, you know, kind of fast forward. So uh, I don't think we can, we can say for certain uh, that, uh, you know, this is a longer term, uh, you know, conflict like the Cold War that we are, we are going to see, but certainly in the short If we say in the next, uh, you know, let's say four to five years, we are going to see this is position in China after uh, next November. Uh, we are likely to see a lot more of it. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, things might once again change. Right. Uh, so 
I think yeah, that's the end of the session, Professor. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's been uh, it's been so wonderful to listen to you, and uh, th this is an extensive account of the relations of between the countries. And for me, particularly, it's been extremely fascinating. And I'm sure that's how the entire audience might have also enjoyed it. And this session, uh, it's recorded and it will be uploaded to the YouTube channel of Radio Sofia. And I'm sure many more will benefit from this session. Much. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I also enjoyed it very much. And thank you uh, to all of you for the best. Very, very interesting questions. Very good questions, important questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you.